two degrees, leading to millions more lives lost, thousands more species going extinct, and much more widespread disruption and suffering. On current trends, scientists predict rises near three or four degrees, which will result in the complete breakdown of our planet and an extremely precarious future. Time is running out to take the action needed to avert this disaster, so we need to start transforming our world life today as quickly as possible to get to zero carbon emissions. So that's why I welcome that we're having this debate tonight, and the issue I've campaigned, for, campaigned on for well over a decade is finally getting the appropriate level of attention. But it's also a bit depressing that we wait till the 59th minute of the 11th hour to finally acknowledge the scale of the challenge before us. It shouldn't have come as a surprise. World leaders agreed in Kyoto in 1990 that action was needed to curb the emission of greenhouse gases. Since then, successive governments have prioritised economic growth above the well-being of the planet, and we have doubled the concentration of man-made greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We have now warmed the planet by over one degree Celsius, and the carbon dioxide we've already emitted will continue to warm the planet even if we stopped any further emissions tomorrow. So the window for action is extremely narrow. Any delay could be hugely costly for future generations, so we owe it to them to act decisively. Tonight, I hope that this council will vote to declare a climate emergency. But of course, that will just be the starting point. If the new climate change committee is just another talking shop which gets ignored by the mayor and the cabinet, then we've all failed. We need to see real urgency, and we also need to have honesty about the things that aren't going in the right direction and which we need to be better on. We need to be considering every aspect of our lifestyles and doing what we can to ensure they're compatible with a zero carbon future. There are many challenges, and I know, as, as the mayor has said, that in some cases we're going to need to change the government policy. And of course we're going to need government support and finance in order to achieve our aims. But there are, there are also rightly limits to what a council can make an individual do. But there are many changes we as a council can make. And there are some changes that Liverpool City Council need to make quickly. For example, there are a number of significant road projects which are currently in the pipeline. It beggars belief that we're still planning to spend huge sums of public money increasing road capacity predicted increases in traffic. This has to be stopped and a plan needs to be put in place to reduce the number of cars on our city roads. <coughs> Liverpool's roads are among the most dangerous in the country for cyclists and pedestrians. And not enough has been done to reduce and properly enforce speed limits. This would be a simple way to make roads safer and give people more confidence to walk and cycle rather than using their cars. The city continues to press ahead with plans for airport expansion <coughs> and the growth of the cruise industry. It's not clear how these are going to be accounted for when measuring our progress towards net zero. We also need to find a way to include the things that the people of Liverpool consume because the production of these things is a huge contributor to greenhouse gas. So while we do have improvements happening in individual areas within the council, there remain areas where the, the current policies are ignoring or actively working against the aims of a zero carbon city. For any plan to succeed, it will require investment. In March, the Green Party produced a fully costed climate emergency budget, which would have generated £120 million to kickstart the Green Revolution in Liverpool. It was voted down by Labour and the Lib Dems, but I implore you to go back and take another look at it as a starting point for ways to raise money that we need to start making a difference. Lots of good words are going to be said tonight, but the planet needs you to put your money where your mouth is and finance the green transformation that we need. After the declaration of the climate emergency, the real work begins. There will have to be policy changes that are politically risky, such as traffic reduction. But I sincerely believe that the price of a cleaner, safer, truly low carbon city will be worth the effort. And people's quality of life will be dramatically improved if we have the courage and determination do what's right today. Thank you, Councillor Crowe. Can I now invite Councillor Steve Bradford to speak, please? <laughs> On behalf of the uh, Liberal Party, I'm not to describe myself as a constructive opposition. Just, sorry, my apologies. I never, didn't ever realise I needed one. Uh, on behalf of the 
Liberal Party and his council constructive opposition. When the city was faced with some dramatic financial uh, cutbacks, which were disproportionate the city has ever faced, uh, we stood up to the table and participated in the Budget Work Party. And I think we got a better process by talking in privately and constructively around the table about the problems and the solutions that we could have done. And we committed ourselves and we followed it all the way through. And I hope all the opposition parties this time do that in good faith, not play the hokey hokey one foot in, one foot out, as the moment seems. Um, my Lord Mayor, uh, we know about the Industrial Revolution. I think today we've got to focus ourselves on the environmental revolution. How do we make our economy and our social and political structures suitable to save the environment and make a better life? I would dissent slightly from all that. I think there is great value in to see that environmental measures could be costed to give benefits and reduce costs on public services. The benefits of improving air pollution and reducing the cost on social services and people being ill is a positive benefit we should articulate. Um, and I also think we should focus, as Lord Denver said earlier and the young speakers uh, from uh, the Strike UK, of immediate measures which are achievable and affordable and practical. As a personal manager, I often shared when we had the cutbacks that actually dealing with a problem early makes it easier to work with and can put the problem to the end and, and deal with it dramatically at the end. That's something I learned from commercial practice that made through seven industrial um, downsizes my company had to go through. So, immediate actions can make it easier. And I can just want to suggest a few immediate actions that we've been articulating at many committees that I think could be urgently looked at. At the moment, we have considerable unspent one, Section 106 money in the council coffers, which actually we don't spend, developers can reclaim. I suggested when uh, Steve Mummy was the executive member um, many, many times to do exactly what we did at one of our own community centres. We put LED lighting in, we put heat insulation in, and we put solar panels in. Small capital spent actually increased the run cost of our community centre plus help the environment. It was a profitable way to save the environment. I have to say, it, we hadn't waited for Section 106 request to come through because it wouldn't have been done. But we've got it from other sources. But I'd like to see us as a council roll to every other community centre and community buildings around the city. How we could link Section 106 monies which you have got ample money on to actually put heat insulation into their community buildings. It would also help them to be more viable to deliver public services. And I am frustrated, we've been articulating this for many, many years. At the moment, we, we hear about cycle lanes. I was visiting colleagues in Manchester and how they're drawn up in their community, neighbourhood cycle lanes. At the moment, we have massive res uh, resurfing of pavements down Prescott Road in the city. Is there a second against the cycle lane? No. <laughs> Why not? We're spending money in a way that could be used to improve, make it easier for our residents to save the environment now. Our office cycled into the city centre and you put your fingers, you put your life in your hands and you're coming down West Derby Road to Brook. And it's not just about what particular cyclists. There is no segregated cycle lanes, and most cyclists actually go on the pavements, which is wrong, which is dangerous to older residents, particularly in shopping areas like Jim Brook, where you couldn't dream of cycling down the major routes safely because of the traffic. So why, when we're putting a new pavement into Prescott Road this week, are we putting segregated cycle lanes? There are things we can do immediately now with the money we're spending now. Tree planting, terrific. I mean, I'm going to do a project when we tackled drainage problems in Mission Park by putting 5,000 trees by the railway line. As all members, we've been asking for tree granting in this to drive common, which has drainage problems, which means the park can't be used as sports. And that still hasn't been progressed. There are immediate things we can do now. The strategy is right, but the strategy will mean nothing unless we actually drill down to 
every neighbourhood constructs me. And it's not just about money. Sometimes the measures we're proposing will save public services money by improving people's health and using the facilities that are there. Um, I'm delighted with the measure. I don't agree with people who could have acted earlier, but let's get on with it. We will step up to the table and we will do our bit. Uh, as has been said earlier, we now turn to the four themed debates and the first one will be transport and air quality and a short video will be played.